So again, welcome to the last day of the conference. My name is Ayat Hamdan, a researcher at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. Um, I am um, um, glad to introduce our speaker today, who are going to speak about the intelligence studies from different perspectives and experiences. Uh, our first speaker is Peter Jackson. He's a chair in a global security at the University of Glasgow and executive director of the Scotch Council in Global Affairs. He was editor of Intelligence and National Security Journal for 12 years. He has taught at the University of Cambridge, Yale, among other universities in the UK and France. His areas uh, of his specialization include the international history of 19th and the 20th century, and the use of history in the formulation of foreign and defense policy, and the role of intelligence in the policy making from both historical and contemporary perspectives. Professor Peter, you have uh, 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks to everyone for coming along. Thanks especially to the organizers of the conference and Omar and his team especially. It's a super impressive event and I'm really pleased and honored to be here. So thank you very much. What I'm going to offer over the next 19 and a half minutes, I guess, is uh, an impressionistic survey, a necessarily subjective survey of what is a really dynamic and growing field of research, uh, a field also of policy engagement. I won't do justice to non-Western uh, perspectives because Mohanad Saloon has given us an excellent uh, uh, overview of, of some of that. I will mention it as, as part of what I hope will be the future of intelligence studies, but uh, I won't get the attention it deserves. I want to begin with the past, since my topic is the past, present, and future, and I want to point especially to three pioneers in the study of intelligence. Quite interestingly, two of these three pioneers are women. Uh, the first is Sherman Kent, who directed the analysis side, the uh, analytical uh, side of CIA during its early years. A trained historian who wrote a book called Strategic Intelligence for American World Policy, which is still uh, a work that, that, that uh, rewards reading not only from an historical perspective, because, but also for the way he tries to define intelligence. Second one is a book by Roberta Volstetter, Pearl Harbor, uh, Warning and Decision. This is a superb book which integrates communications theory into the study of intelligence published in 1962. And in particular, I introduced the concepts of signals and noise, reliable signals which are often obscured by background noise. Uh, I'm not sure that it bears uh, the, weight of, the weight of time in terms of an analysis of Pearl Harbor in and of itself, because historians are still debating whether or not there were actually signals, reliable signals, that the Japanese were intended to, intending to attack Pearl Harbor when they did. But on the other hand, the concept of signals and noise is incredibly useful for all scholars of intelligence, and in fact, all, all scholars of decision making in any context. And the third person I think is worth highlighting is Ada Bozeman, that there should be two Ds there uh, instead of one, who was a very interesting person. She was born in the interwar period in, in uh, Latvia and uh, educated in Germany and in the United States, and was one of the first to teach uh, intelligence as a component of decision-making, policy-making, and statecraft. And this collection that I pointed to, Strategic Intelligence and Statecraft, is a collection of her essays from the 60s and 70s primarily. Interesting not least because she was one of the very first to call for more attention to the study of intelligence across different cultures and policy cultures and political cultures, and in particular calling for uh, greater attention to what we would now call the Global South in, in, in intelligence studies, which is, I think, very interesting. The 1970s and 80s saw an explosion of work. I've listed some of the works here. The most influential, Dave Kahn's book, 
1967, the Code Breakers was a really revolutionary moment in the history of intelligence and the amount of work that he was able to, the amount of uh, uh, evidence that he was able to unearth uh, was crucial. And then he founded Cryptologia, which is still the best, I think, journal devoted to signals intelligence in the world back in 1977. And then Robert Jervis, Bob Jervis, the dear and recently departed Bob Jervis, uh, his book Perception and Misperception is hugely important for uh, shaping our understanding, our, our, our approaches, to, and our thinking about uh, intelligence and its relationship to policy. Sir Harry Hinsley, a former uh, member of Bletchley Park, uh, one of the negotiators of what is still the world's most, uh, uh, the closest and, and most comprehensive signals communications intelligence alliance, uh, began the first of the, uh, a multi-volume series on history on the British intelligence in the Second World War. So Harry also examined my PhD, so I feel especially obliged to mention him here. Uh, Richard Betts, Dick Betts, wrote a, an article called Analysis, War, and Decision, Why Intelligence Failures Are Inevitable, the single most cited, the single most influential study on the history, in, uh, on, the, on, on intelligence and intelligence studies still. Michael Handel, a hugely influential figure in strategic studies and intelligence, one of the first to think systematically about uh, intelligence as an element in strategic studies and also as an element in, in war and strategy. Christopher Andrew, who was one of my supervisors for my PhD, wrote a book called Secret Service, which was the first archive-based history of an intelligence service uh, ever, that, to my knowledge, which is based, the majority of which on archives. And then another really important book from this, mo this, this period is by Locke Johnson, another editor. I edited Intelligence and National Security with Locke for many years, uh, which is basically based on his experiences as a staffer on the church committee, which looked into covert action, very famous committee that uncovered all of the uh, uh, strange, sometimes very strange CIA plots, for example, to do away with Fidel Castro, uh, but really introduced the academic study of covert action, as well as in including the study of oversight and accountability, hugely important and worth mentioning. Another thing to mention, I'm rushing through this quite quickly because I want to get through and I don't want to take time from my fellow panelists, uh, is that from the beginning, this is a field that has been shaped by the active participation of practitioners. And uh, in the United States model, in fact, people like Bob Jervis or Dick Betts would move in and out of the intelligence community. Something that was unthinkable, certainly in Canada or Great Britain or France, uh, the three countries that I'm most familiar with. And this is a really interesting model which I think in some ways enriched the study of intelligence, but also made it, I think, oriented it more toward policy and gave it a more problem-solving uh, character. And in Great Britain, I suppose this, the, the, the role of practitioners has come through memoirs especially, but also the participation of intelligence veterans in the intelligence study group, uh, the, which is a it's innocuous sounding, but in fact, it's a, it's a kind of a closed club of academics and practitioners that get together and talk about intelligence matters, usually somewhere in a room in Rusi or, or uh, uh, some, someplace else in London, usually, or, or Cambridge. In Oxford sometimes, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, especially since Michael Herman's been there, mainly in London, mainly at Rusi, in fact. Uh, and in this field, access to practitioners was a source of legitimacy and credibility in ways that are problematic and, and that, and, and pro which is problematic in ways that I don't think many of us were all that conscious of and should, and should have really thought more seriously about sooner. Because there is a problem when practitioners are allowed to participate in the shaping of a new field of inquiry. And it's something that I would be happy to talk about in, in question time, uh, if you like. The 1990s especially were a moment where archival historians seemed to play a more active role in the study of intelligence. 
Uh, most of the most influential books, I would argue, were by historians, including Wesley Wark, uh, John Ferris, Michael Handel, Klaus Euler, Klaus Jürgen Müller, for example. Uh, my own book was published just at the end of that period. Archival-based studies of the impact of intelligence on policy. So it was still that intelligence policy nexus, which uh, has, I think, its, its advantages, but also uh, it has its limitations. I'll try and uh, discuss more of those later. The period that I've mentioned was also, also witnessed in the early 2000s, a number of attempts to define intelligence, including first and in some ways most influentially by Sherman Kent, who basically said intelligence is what intelligence agencies do. And that was very influential. It's still, I think, a definition that's influential within a certain milieu of intelligence scholars, not least people like Mark Stout and, and uh, 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 Michael Warner, these people who were in the intelligence community and then came out. A uh, concept of government intelligence. Intelligence is information to help shape government policy. Uh, very important. And in these two definitions, intelligence is really a tool to inform policy and to reduce uncertainty. And this is how it was conceptualized for a long time. Uh, this was challenged, not least by, by myself, and I argued that sometimes intelligence should, in a normative sense, actually increase uncertainty. You know, if there are things that are, aren't known, this isn't, it's incumbent on an intelligence analyst to say, we don't know. But this is very difficult to do. Decision, maker, decision makers hate this. And so the idea of, uh, and, and I think David Oman, and, and, and if I can say so myself, expressed it better, when kind of reducing ignorance rather than uncertainty is probably a better way to think about it. Some scholars have argued that intelligence has to be secret. In fact, secrecy and secret information obtained from clandestine means as opposed to open source information is what gives intelligence its distinct character as opposed to other means of information gathering to inform policy. This is problematic as well because from the very beginning, from the, before the First World War, intelligence services have always gained the vast, vast majority of their information from open sources, whether it's newspapers or the internet uh, or whatever. And probably one word I suppose I'm most uh, sympathetic to, but it has its own problems, is really to start thinking about intelligence mainly as information. Uh, you know, the French word for intelligence is renseignement, which is information, because it's what's common to almost all intelligence activities in one way or another, and it posits the fact that information to, to understand the social world that we're living in, uh, including world politics, is, is essential to all intelligence activity. Uh, but all of these attempts to define intelligence run up to the fact that intelligence does these myriad different functions and activities. It has inside, outside, domestic and international character in terms of security. Foreign intelligence collects, you know, there's the different intelligence disciplines we call them, human, uh, human intelligence, communications intelligence, imagery intelligence, measurement and signals intelligence, mass int, and you can go on and on and on. Uh, there, but there's also a, a strong element of domestic collection, which has, operates under different rules, ideally, not always. Uh, there's also analysis, which is, a, I suppose, a separate stage, the intelligence cycle, uh, surveillance, which is more important than ever, because the, uh, the, the, uh, the cameras that dot the United Kingdom that are, in fact, everywhere on every UK road are uh, a form of in, in information gathering, which is sometimes used for intelligence purposes, police intelligence, covert action, international intelligence cooperation is another dimension of intelligence activity or practice, uh, police work. And so this is the, at this moment when we, we, this is some of the things that we were thinking of when I wrote an article with my colleague, Len Scott, which uh, uh, we wrote it very quickly, but it has probably the most cited thing I've ever written. And maybe the reason why Omar invited me today, I'm not sure. But uh, here, 
I made a conceptual distinction between two very different types of intelligence activity. The first is intelligence as a tool to inform policy. You know, the collection, analysis, and dissemination of information to inform policy, to inform decision making, whether it's government policy or an NGO policy or charity policy, uh, and, and all of these happen through uh, the collection of open and secret information. It's a tool to inform policy, but it's also used as a tool in the execution of policy. And we see this in, in warfare, in, 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 in military operations. We've just been hearing about a lot of intelligence functions in the last presentation. But it's very different. And in, in this, this uh, function of intelligence as a tool in the execution of policy, some people argue shouldn't be termed intelligence at all. It should be something else. Uh, I've never taken a position on that. I would sympathetic to the idea, but it would certainly cut off and reduce the scope of the field of intelligence studies, which may, may not be in my interest. I'm not sure. But this opens the way to thinking about intelligence as a tool of state oppression, which has been one of its key functions. I mean, it's been probably one of its key functions for as long as information has been gathered and used to inform uh, uh, a pol political authority. But we know most about it, for example, from the French Revolution. Or Nazi Germany has provided a lot of data uh, that's been used by scholars. Soviet Russia, and laterally, even liberal democratic societies as well. But it is impossible to imagine, for example, the existence of the Soviet Union or probably current uh, Russia under Putin, unless we understand Russia is, in many extents, an intelligent state. An intelligent state. Uh, but it's a very different kind of intelligence. Covert action is another way in which intelligence is used. Deception, there, there are, uh, I could go on and on. And I ar we, we argued, we identified together three approaches to the study of intelligence as a means of explaining decisions in foreign defense policy or in, 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 in war. And this is favored by military and international historians uh, to derive general models to explain success and failure in the intelligence process. It's another very, very influential uh, approach to intelligence studies. And also intelligence as a, stool, as a tool of oppression and state control. Five minutes. Five minutes, gotcha. So the 11th of September was a watershed in many ways in the evolution of intelligence studies. The war on terror, the invasion of Iraq opened up all kinds of vistas for people interested in intelligence, both from an accountability and oversight perspective, but also uh, just to try and understand decision making. We you know whether or not uh, these weapons existed in Iraq was a big question. Uh, it also I think stimulate a lot of work on intelligence sharing, both within uh, national communities, but also across na uh, international boundaries and even between NGOs and private intelligence agencies and state intelligence agencies that led to root and branch calls for root and branch restructuring of intelligence. And from the work by Amy Ziegart is a great example of this. But I think a lot of this work during the in kind of the, in the heated aftermath of September 11th and then the invasion of Iraq, uh, a lot of the calls for different intelligence structures were made with insufficient awareness that there is no perfect way of structuring an intelligence community and that every reform, every restructuring measure creates new insufficiencies and new vulnerabilities that, that aren't aware of. In other words, it's like in some ways generals preparing to fight the last war. Uh, and the excesses of Western intelligence agencies, uh, particularly in Iraq, stimulated a much greater concern for legality, oversight, accountability, and ethics. And ethics became a new uh, and vibrant area of research. New centers of research uh, emerged in Aberystwyth, where I was for, for 12 years, where I'm proud to say we developed the world's first undergraduate degree in intelligence studies outside of... Uh, uh, you know, government, state agencies, which is the, this did take place in the United States. Law, police intelligence, ethics, early work on epidemiology, 
uh, in the aftermath of the AIDS pandemic, bird flu H1N1 and HN51, Ebola and SARS. When I was editing the journal in the 2000s, I published a few of the first articles on epidemiology, I'm proud to say. Philosophy, including work on normative political theory, in other words, ethics especially, but also probability theory. Surveillance is a big theme. Uh, women intelligence, often informed by gender theory. But it was still defined by Anglo-American dominance and the glaring lack of work on non-Western agencies. There was also a growing move to try and develop a unifying theory of intelligence, which I think has been a failure, and I think will continue to be a failure because of these varied, the, the, the varied character of intelligence activities, intelligence practices. Uh, Pete Gill and Mark Fithian, in a very influential and much cited book, argued that the discipline of intelligence studies to date has spent relatively little time theorizing. I would argue that that's wrong. In fact, a lot of the work uh, from the 1970s and eight, from the 80s and 90s, especially the 80s, was about trying to de derive theoretical insights into the nature of intelligence rather than devise a unifying theory, which I think is maybe a fool's game, but I'm not a social scientist. So I'm an historian and I don't feel obliged to develop a generalizable theory of intelligence. Uh, I think we should instead focus on borrowing concepts from other, other disciplines to derive new theoretical insights that help us better understand the nature and characteristic of intelligence. As far as the future is concerned, there are reasons to be positive. I think intelligence studies is a much more confident field of scholarship. It's more transdisciplinary than ever. There are new critical perspectives which are to be welcomed, even if sometimes I think they, de they, they deploy theories and concepts from the philosophy of knowledge that they don't understand properly. And I'm happy to debate that uh, 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 in questions and answers. Global public health is more important than ever uh, in the aftermath of, of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But there are negatives as well, including a growing divergence between historical approaches and social science approaches. Historians now have their own journal, the Journal of Intelligence History, and it's, 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 it's just a very different way of approaching intelligence, and there's a moving apart, which I don't think is helpful as an historian. Uh, there's a drift away from studying analysis, I think, although there are important exceptions to this rule, uh, and Ukraine, I think, has provided some new uh, the, the, the kind of the way in which, for example, the Ukrainian-Russian balance and the, the correlation of forces is a, is a Russian, Russian term. These, these, these areas, I think, bear, bear more. The digital revolution, I'm, I'm, I'm hurry, I am almost minute, finished. Please. Yeah, Big data after Edward Snowden, I think this is very, very important. And it really underlined how intelligence practices are taking place in the digital realm. Uh, there's a proliferation of intelligence actors enabled, not least by, by the internet, and Bellingcat's a great example. Many of you may know that Bellingcat was the first uh, intelligence agency. It's a private intelligence agency. In fact, for a while it was run in people's basement to identify the identity of Sergei Skripal, who was, the, the, not his identity, the identity of the GRU uh, operatives who tried to assassinate him in in Winchester in, in 2016, I think. And now, with access to such a panoply of sources from the internet, I think there is a proliferation of intelligence actors, and this is very important. New sources, some people say that social media intelligence is a new collection discipline, for example. I'm not sure it is, but it certainly uh, kind of underlines the fact that uh, the, the, the scope of intelligence collection is more vast than ever, and this, I suppose, points to the big data question, which Snowden really brought to the forefront of the public, intention, uh, pub public attention. Non-Western intelligence agencies, uh, I, I defer to Mohanad in some ways, but I would argue that there's a problem of sources. And one of the reasons why the Anglo-American communities are so intensely studied is we have such good sources of information in these communities. Even the French case, is, it's, it's crazy. But in fact, some of the f files that I looked at in the 2000s, in 2004 even, are now reclassified and unavailable for consultation because of changing practices of classification, declassification. And this is mad. 
It's great, though, that there are more scholars from the global south working in intelligence. That's a hugely positive development. I was going to have a go at critical intelligence studies. I won't, but we can do that in, in question and answer. But uh, for now, I'll just say thanks for your attention and, and move on. Thank you. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for this insightful presentation. We will move to the second speaker, uh, Professor Owen Thirst. He's an adjunct professor of security studies at the University of Montana's Defense Critical Language and Culture program, where he teaches the politics and history of Middle East. He is the author of several books in intelligence, including the Egyptian Intelligence Service, Pakistan's Inter-Service Intelligence uh, Directorate, and Iran, Quds Force, Proxy Wars, Terrorism, and the War on America as well as peer-reviewed articles on the National Intelligence Service of Angola, Mozambique, and Afghanistan. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm going to start out by saying I think it's entirely appropriate um, that I'm on the uh, intelligence uh, briefing today because my picture in the uh, booklet is obviously not me. <laughs> so I'm in my coat and dagger mode right now. Um, but what we're going to talk about today uh, briefly is... Uh, uh, reviewing uh, Egyptian intelligence and what that can tell us about uh, intelligence studies in general. Uh, so you've probably seen at some point or another, if you're following the discipline, the famous statement that intelligence is the missing dimension, right? Uh, which was apparently a British Foreign Office official, but now it's become you know much more of a uh, a, a quoted thing about intelligence. The missing dimension of what? Of political science of international relations, diplomatic and military history. Um, it seems to be multifaceted in that regard. Um, the thing about the scholarship, and this strikes me in particular, my, my personal interest is the Middle East, um, is the lack of geographical breadth. And sometimes I think people fall back on, well, there's a lack of geographical breadth um, for all of these reasons, not the least of which is sources. And there's certainly some truth to that. Um, there's a lot of coverage of Western agencies. Now, I grew up in Canada, um, and I'm struck by how many references there are to the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service in Intelligence and National Security, which is a, a peer-reviewed journal. I'm like, wow, I just didn't know Intel was such a big deal in Canada. But, but when you switch to other countries, uh, there's relatively little. I mean, there's a decent amount on Russia, but then again, it's the Russians, right? I mean. In some ways, it seems like they kind of invented the game. But there's a lot less on the Arab uh, uh, and And why is that so? Um, we can go through you know, what intelligence has done for our understanding of World War II, for example, the revelations of the Enigma secret uh, in the early 1970s. I mean, that's a well-kept secret when you think about it. Uh, but what it did to shape our understanding of different battles uh, during World War II. The fact that Churchill knew that Coventry was gonna be bombed, right? But he couldn't do anything about it because it would reveal that he knew the secret in advance. Um, the revelation of Venona, which was uh, 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 the US very opportunistic and fortuitous decryption of Soviet intelligence traffic. Um, but again, getting back to the point, uh, when you look at the specialist literature in particular, and I named two journals here, um, superb journals, by the way, um, and, and there's a tremendous amount of information in them, but the lack of geographical breadth, uh, and especially of the Arab world, but I might as well put a plug in uh, for Africa, 
Uh, there's very, very little there on Africa, and uh, surprisingly, not a whole lot on China. So let's get to Arab intelligence studies. Not a whole lot of analysis right now. Um, I'm struck, for example, when looking at books on uh, the Arab political world, uh, you know, especially authoritarian studies, and how little there is any mention at all of intelligence. It's almost in passing. Uh, maybe one reference. Uh, and, and that strikes me because think about this. We all think about the Arab world and the word mukhabarat often comes up, or istikhbarat, you know, depending on where you are. And you think about the combinations and connections and it's like, we're leaving something out here. Um, so the English studies are relatively rare. There's a lot of popular coverage uh, and I'm, I just picked this book out. I, I think it's kind of funny, you know, who killed this guy? It was the British, right? It's always the British. Um, but a pretty limited academic value because there's just not a lot of source citations. And as a former Intel analyst myself, you live and die by your source citations. Um, a couple of exceptions like the Iraq War in 2003. Um, so why is there a problem? I mean, why is there so little? Um, part of it is state secrecy, right? I mean, when you think about it, al amin right, the security. There's a security fetish in the Arab world. Um, and it's not to say there isn't one in the Western world as well, but here it's just all-embracing. Um, the access to Arab archives is very limited. I'm always surprised from time to time by studies that come out and, and they find something, right? It's like, how did he find that? He wrote a book on the Egyptian divas of the 1920s, right? Very different from intelligence. Um, but he found sources mentioning espionage in Egypt in the early 20th century. I thought, huh, I missed that. <laughs> um, there's very limited utility in Western archives. And as uh, Dr. Jackson mentioned, I mean, this is such an archive heavy study, right? You need the archives. But what do they do? They, they, they tell you what Brits or Americans thought or said in their interactions with Arab counterparts. So it's already kind of secondhand. And as Dr. Jackson points out in his article, which I also made extensive use of, there uh, in a lot of occasions, remember that what you find in an archive has already been filtered for you by the government concerned, right? Uh, Dr. Jackson mentioned that in the case of France, oh, well, we've decided that we're taking those back because, you know, there's something secret in them. Maybe it's probably embarrassing to a government agency. Um, the use of memoirs is challenging for all the obvious reasons. I mean, when you think about it, um, you know, memoirs are a lot about me, me, I, 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 and going to leave out the embarrassing parts. Um, and so there's problems with those as well. And then I would say there's a language barrier. Um, there shouldn't be, right? But there is. And I come from a, a, a very practical shop at the University of Montana, which teaches languages. And believe me, a lot of our students do not want to learn Arabic because it's a level five language in the US categorization of languages, which means it's very difficult. And I think a lot of times, scholars kind of sidestep the language issue, right, and use only English language sources, which seems kind of crazy to me. Um, so what's a good analytical product, right? And here I'm speaking entirely from the practical former analyst point of view. Multiple sources. Um, and here you see the interesting parallels between academia and, uh, and what happens in the intelligence community. Archival data, it's nice to have that, right? To be able to quote that. Uh, embassy cables. Uh, cable is diplomatic jargon for whatever the ambassador or the political officer wrote at that point in time based on his or her interaction with an official. Um, memoirs, sketchy, you got to take them with a grain of salt. My favorite, and I'll, I'll keep this short, um, Miles Copeland, former CIA case officer, wrote a legion of books about the Arab world. And one of my favorite pieces of Copeland lore, which is total BS, is that the CIA not only was willing, witting to the 1952 Egypt coup, 
that brought Gamal Abdel Nasser to power, but in fact they did it, right? They gave him the, gave him the green light. And he's the only person who's ever said that, but it's amazing to me how many scholars have then taken that as fact, and it isn't. Um, oral histories can be useful, but it's mainly diplomats. Um, you'll be hard pressed to find somebody who was a former CIA case officer, although they do talk a lot and they do write a lot, um, but honestly talking about his or her career. Newspapers, uh, my colleague mentioned, is, is open source intelligence intelligence? Sure as hell is. I can tell you as a former intel analyst that probably 75% of whatever I wrote included open source intelligence, but it's not sexy, right? You know, my, my old boss used to say, you don't have human in there, human intelligence. I'm like, it's information. It, it rings true. We put an analysis on it, but it has no intelligence. Well, no, actually it is. Um, so in the final minute that I have left, um, these are some areas I think would be very interesting for uh, those of you out there uh, to explore. Uh, uh, signals intelligence or cryptography. So two years ago, there was a revelation in the Washington Post about a Swiss company called Crypto AG. Um, and for decades, Crypto AG was kind of the gold standard uh, in encryption machines. It's like Enigma, you know, but for the present age. And CIA and the German intelligence service secretly bought this company in the early 1970s bought it, but in secret, right? So if you were a customer of Crypto AG, you went and bought the product thinking, yeah, it's a, it, it's a company, it's got its you know, uh, reputation on the line. Be careful. All of these countries, and yes, including Qatar, bought Crypto AG machines. What does that mean about US policy towards the Middle East since at least 1970, when the National Security Agency was effectively reading all the embassy communications from the Saudi embassies around the world. What does it tell us about the 1973 Arab-Israeli War? What does it tell us about the 1979 Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty? What does it tell us about the energy crisis, right? Think about this. These are all avenues of approach that I think need to be explored. The last, and this will be my last slide, um, Professor Christopher Andrew pointed out, you know, that intelligence is linked so much to authoritarian states, right? What is Syria under Bashar al-Assad uh, without the Muqabara in all its manifestations? What is Egypt without the Muqabara? Um, what do dictators in these countries demand of their intelligence agencies. Obviously, domestic security is paramount. Um, shaping the assessment. I mean, I, I, I put this kind of half jokingly, but who the hell went to Saddam Hussein in 1990 in August and said, boss, I don't think invading Kuwait would be such a good idea. I mean, honestly, think about this. I mean, there are real implications to speaking truth to power in these regimes. Imagine somebody telling Bashar al-Assad in, in, in March uh, uh, 2011 that, you know, there's this city called Dara, and there are a lot of really angry people there, and it's about to blow. But he had just given a speech, right, saying, well, the situation in Syria is not like Egypt, and it's not like Libya or Tunisia. People like their leader here, right? And, of course, we know what happened next. Um, these are things that I think need more exploration and examination uh, by scholars, um, and, and, I, and I think that's worth pointing out. I'm going to skip over these other things. We can talk about them another time. Um, my personal favorite is covert action, by the way. Is covert action actually an intel discipline? I mean, think about this. Just because intel agencies do it doesn't, I mean, if you want to be academic about it, right, and what is this but an academic conference? I mean, what is covert action and how does it fit in the intel paradigm? Um, this is my favorite character of the moment, David Smiley, former British SAS veteran in North Yemen of all places, uh, paid for by the Saudi government to help the Yemeni royalists uh, defeat the Egyptian-backed forces. So my conclusions, lots of work ahead. 
Um, but that's good, right? Keeps us all in business. Um, contrary to conventional wisdom, I think there are sources to analyze. It's just it, you have to be very careful with this, like memoirs. But even you know, embassy communications, like I said, it's been filtered twice, right? One by the person writing the cable and his or her own biases, two by the government releasing this for public viewing. Um, but that, you know, that isn't to exclude that, that archives can be very useful uh, uh, tools for research. Um, I would end on this note, though. What I want to see, you know, here's getting on my soapbox, is not me, an obviously uh, uh, white male, uh, Anglo-Saxon background, or whatever you're going to call it. Um, I, I want to see people with far more fluency in Arabic than I have um, uh, being able to use authentic Arabic sources, newspapers. Uh, God help us if there are archives, you know, even those and producing intelligence that expands our knowledge of this field and has applicability not only to understanding the Arab world, but understanding the role of intelligence in human societies. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sirs. Um, we'll move to our third speaker. He will join us virtually. I hope that he's ready. I hope that you can hear me. So, Professor Gordon Akrab, he's with us. Yes, uh, I am. Yes. He's an assistant professor of information science at the University of Zagreb. He's editor in chief of the journal National Security and the future founder and president of the Hybrid uh, Warfare Research Institute and main organizer of the Zagreb Security Forum. He received his PhD in information and communication science for, from the University of Zagreb 2011 with a dissertation titled Inform, uh, Inf Informa Informational Strategies and Operation in Public Knowledge uh, Shaping. He had an active role in Croatia homeland war for independence during his career in Croatia's diplomatic and intelligence structure, he completed a number of pro professional courses, including the Diplomatic Academy. His research interests include national and regional security, intelligence, and the history of homeland war, and has published a number of books, journal articles, and conferences papers. Uh, Professor Gordon, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Thank you, Ayat. Thanks to everybody. It's a really big uh, pleasure to be here with, with you. I'm sorry I'm, that I'm not here with you in, in Doha, but being positive, it's not always a positive thing, it looks like. Also, I would like to congratulate to Dr. Omar and his team for this excellent conference and ability to discuss a little bit deeper about the things uh, that, that are bothering us all and that are going to be much more interesting for us in the future that is coming. Uh, for Just for example, I'm very proud that Peter mentioned the Journal of Intelligence History and I'm very proud to be a member of the board of the organization that stands behind this journal. Uh, be sure that, Peter, that I'm going to send that to, to Mark Pitti and Shlom Spiro, who are the co-editors of the journal. That the journal has been read by the experts all around the world. Uh, would you like to start my presentation, please, because I can't see it. Thank you. As you can see, I, I'm going to say a few words about the intelligence of hybrid threats and interdependence and interfinic. As far as I understand, I am one of those who Peter and mentioned previously that I'm the one who was uh, head of the operations of the Foreign Intelligence Agency in Croatia. And now, since 10 or 11, 11 years, I'm back in academia. So I'm, I'm trying to connect the professional experience with the knowledge and expertise and the, the language of the academia in order to produce much more knowledge and to transfer it to our future students, not just in Croatia and abroad. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this is briefly the content that I would like to share with you in these 20 minutes about from the hybridity of risk and threats to the, uh, to the artificial intelligence and the activities that needs to be done in already today and in, in future that will define 
the future intelligence and hybridity of intelligence activities. And I'm going to give you a few conclusions. Next slide, please. We all know what are the hybrid threats. In most cases, uh, the definition is uh, very complicated and very long, but as the I would like to use a shortage of the what the Chinese strategists brought in the book Under City Warfare in '99. Everything what can be used against the humans and human mankind, it can be, it can be and has to be used when it's appropriate and it's when, when it's necessary. The, but the main point of the hybrid threats are the influence of cognitive operations and all other things, how we are going to do it, when we are going to do it, is just a question of the time and, and vectors of attack. Next slide, please. And I, I would like to just to mention, probably all of you know that and you are familiar with the, some characteristics of the hybrid threats. And uh, we have the multi-vector approach and that's something that intelligence studies needs to be dealt in the future already today that we have to face with the multiple crises at the same time, in the same time frame and same area in order to be effective because crisis and strategic communication and managing the crisis, it's a very, very demanding thing. That, then uh, the, the last point on this slide is something what is very important and is the effectiveness of the hybrid threats activities is the measuring how we can measure the influence operations against the target audiences because this is the ultimate will of any hybrid attacker to change or to shape the the knowledge and uh, the decision making process of the targeted audiences in a way how the hybrid attacker is looking for next slide please and also behind or oh, the the Following for, for characteristics of the hybrid threats, we can see that the key substance for successful hybrid attacks or counter attacks are information and intelligence as a result of the intelligence agency's work and the intelligence process. Whatever we can do, whatever we are, would like to do, whatever we would like to accomplish and to get, we need information. Otherwise, if we don't, if we don't have information that are reliable, that are on time, that are coming from the trustworthy sources, that are compared with already received, gain knowledge, we are going to be in a big problem because we might be victims of the disinformation activities. I'm going to send it a little bit more later. Next slide, please. This is what was written in a book written in 1989, and it perfectly fit also today. Uh, we saw it. <laughs> excuse me. We saw it during our homeland war in 90s and uh, 95, 96 and 98, that we were faced with a similar things, similar challenges during all of the time. And we can see it now. We have the multiplication of the targets. We have a different domains of the intelligence collection and analysis process. We have a multiplication of the consumers, new challenges for collection and analysis and new roles and expectations of intelligence. So the, the, the point is that despite the fact that the surrounding is changing, the environment is changing, the main task and main challenges that are in front of the intelligence agencies are keeping the same from the from the, uh, from the last several uh, decades. And this is the something that we can talk about the revolution in intelligence affairs, but mainly this is the revolution in the way of the collection and way of analysis and treating the new domains that are facing, just like that we are facing, we just like to the cyber domain it is. Next slide, please. We saw it also in the example from our home and war and the Ukrainian home and war for independence now fighting the Russian aggression, that importance of reaching information supremacy, what Jacek mentioned yesterday. It's, it's strategic intelligence, it's a warning intelligence what proved to be prove all of the reasons why they were published uh, before the war in, in uh, before the Russian aggression on Ukraine and during the early stages of this war. And they reach all the goals why and reasons why they were published so openly and so widely in all of the world. Now we can talk about the hybrid intelligence and hybridity of intelligence, but in, in most of the cases, and I think what Owen said, that as far as I understand, he was an analytical, from, he was from the Nanderka Department of the Intelligence Community, it's context. Context it means that if you know context, if we have a much more contextual information, we need less intelligence to understand what is really going on and what might be and should be the measures to tackle those challenges. But if we don't know the context, if we don't have a previous knowledge, 
then we need much more intelligence, then we are in much more different hard situations in order to really understand what will happen and what are the what is the other loop decision making process and what are the loop between the actions and consequences. Next slide, please. Importance of strategic intelligence is proved from a many in many different cases. Uh, I would like just like mention here a few of them. Uh, just increased intelligence activities is one of the early warning signals for the upcoming hybrid threats, because receiving and creating strategic intelligence from the intelligence that you are collecting on the on field from different domains, from different targets, can show to those who are trying to identify these kind of intelligence activities what really is going on, what might be, what we might be faced with, and what might be intentions of the hybrid attacker, because behind all of those hybrid threats stands the information and intelligence. And better developing better counter or com intelligence or counter intelligence agencies or intelligence community, it means that we might build up better results in countering hybrid risks and threats. And be, uh, making better and much more efficient intelligence community, it's very hard without the effective intelligence studies. Next slide, please. For example, I will show I will show you one example from the strategic intelligence during our homeland war. On the picture on the right side, you can see the uh, first one on the left is a General Komadic. He was a commander of the Yugoslavian and then Serbian military troops. In, so in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the second one is President Milosevic. From 1991, we were able to, mm -hmm. to put a SIGIN surveillance of the phone communications of the President Milosevic up to the mid 2000s. So you might imagine a situation that you are under attack under reversion of the Serbia and Yugoslavia, and you are able to record his phone, coll phone collections, connections, and phone conversations. And what is most important thing, he and his associates were not aware of the fact that we have, that we can do it. And it was extremely important strategic intelligence that helped us to run, plan, run, can conduct the military, military intelligence operations that we did it, especially in 93, 94, and 95, that lead us to the liberation of the country. Next slide, please. What I mentioned yesterday, but I will repeat briefly today. We, when we were running the war, we, uh, our president, late President Tuchman, and the, the leadership, uh, run the policy, uh, playing the game, chessboard in the four chessboards simultaneous games, where one move on one chessboard influenced directly moves on the other boards. So it was a kinetic chessboard, non-kinetic diplomatic and board and chessboard of the internal cohesion and key substance. The key element of all of those activities was where information or intelligence in, in the later form. Next slide, please. We asked ourselves several times when we were analyzing what was going on in Ukraine concerning the uh, intelligence failures and intelli Russian failures in the first phase. And we, we raised our question when we brought a paper in uh, June last year, was the Russian intelligence was so afraid to say the truth to the President Putin about the real situation in Ukraine because Ukraine 22 was not Ukraine 20, uh, 2014, or were they able to, to get the truth? Or, or something has happened that Putin did not want to accept what was really happened and he was a, become a, a victim of his own prejudices. We know the situation, it was completely, completely controlled situation when President Putin humiliated Director Narushkin from the Director of the Foreign Intelligence Service of the Russia. And they published it open that all world can see. If I was on the place of Narushkin, I would get resigned because it was a huge humiliation. And I know, don't know why he did it, but there was, it was shown how he is treating him. Next slide, please. Second thing, what I would like to mention concerning the uh, battle for Ukraine and against the Russian aggression is the battle for the Kostomel airport, 24, 25 February. And the result, positive result for Ukrainians, was result and influenced by the strategic intelligence activities by the Ukrainian military agency. Next slide, please. But it's also this the, the best effort and best result of the Ukrainian military agency was also covered by the uh, extremely worst case scenario that happens to the agents of one military, one intelligence agency that was done by the Ukrainian Secret Security Service. 
because they make a mistake and they, they kill the, the agents of the uh, Ukrainian military agency in the operations they, they run without asking everybody's approval and without checking the what is really going on. And it, it, it was a very hard thing. And, but those kind of things are happening in the war and there are, they are signals and evidences of the non-coordination and ego effect of the leaders of an intelligence agencies. Next slide, please. Another example of uh, how to transfer the tactical intelligence to intelligence that bring up the strategic consequences is the sinking of the missile cruiser Moscow that was a, a flagship of the Russian, Russian uh, Black Fleet. Black Sea Fleet, please. Next slide, please. As you can see here, on the first attempt to, to sink it down was happened on April 4, 2020. But the because of the fact that the missile cruiser Moscow was hidden be, behind the uh, Odessa gas fields, this attempt was not successful. But Ukrainians developed since 2014. They they start to do what what is necessary to be done, especially in this kind of like, operations. Lessons in the identified and lessons learned, and being patient is uh, one one of the core values of the intelligence activities and intelligence agencies. And they were patient, they were collecting intelligence, and when they get intelligence, so that they are able that they were sure that they are going to be able to repeat the attack against the missile crews and it's going to be successful. They did it on April 13. And after that, it's a history. And we know what has happened uh, with the Russian Black Fleet and why they have to move back away from the Ukrainians. And that helped Ukrainians to conduct the uh, liberation for uh, future liberation activities. Next slide, please. Also, there is a one, uh, one MCDC group published two books, count, uh, defining and countering hybrid warfare framework. I'm mentioning because of the this uh, area which is in circle. Next slide, please. In order to detect the uh, and uh, to fight against the hybrid threats, they mentioned here the fact that uh, you need to discover the unknown unknowns and. I'm a basically an engineer, and I cannot accept that unknown unknowns exist. And as an intelligence officer, searching for the unknown unknowns can bring me to a field of non-knowledge. Next slide, please. And therefore, this unknown unknowns is coming from the famous Donna Rasfeld trying to excuse for the mistakes they did it. Next slide, please. But when we share it in four different knowledge corps, we know uh, we, we can share it in the four different fields. Now I would like to concentrate only on blue one, no known unknowns and unknown, unknown unknowns. Because I think that unknown unknowns cannot exist as a separate knowledge and I will try to prove it later. Please, next slide, please. We can interpret it in, in two different ways. First one is a knowledge by the, guided by the perception of the knowledge. And I will just read in the red, uh, red square. We don't know that we do not know. If it's a case that we are brought in this position, that probably we are victims of the disinformation activities of the opponents. Next slide, please. And and that fits completely to the first theorem of the Miroslav Tuzman, late Professor Miroslav Tuzman theorem of disinformation. If anybody, anyone who accepts this information as a true, accepts all the negative consequences of that information, this information also is a true. Next slide, please. Uh, we can interpret it on a, on a different way, on a second way, and it's knowledge guided by the content. It's explicit and dynamic knowledge. And then we can see it that we do not know, red quadrant, we don't know what we do not know. That it means and it shows us that this knowledge cannot exist as a separate knowledge. It has to be part of the blue one knowledge. And that's the reason why, how we can treat it and how we have to treat it mm -hmm. in, in intelligence activities. Next slide, please. And therefore, I would like to mention that we do not need to discover unknown nanos. We, we know what we don't know, but what we are looking for, especially in fighting hybrid threats, is the context. We are trying to find and to discover and to realize the missing links between the known vectors and possible vectors of the future attacks. Next slide, please. Also, what I mentioned in the beginning, uh, quoting the book from the 1989, uh, is the new challenges for collection and analysis, analysis and that are connected with the new domain, cyber domain. 
And we have increasingly role of the role of the uh, artificial intelligence in collecting the huge amount of the data and information from the different websites, uh, let's say normal uh, normal web and the dark web. We have huge amount of the open source intelligence that are available for us and social media intelligence monitoring is also extremely important. What we need to develop are the, the uh, artificial intelligence abilities and capabilities that can help us to give the hint and to give some kind of the relations and context to the collected informations and give a basis to the humans to analyze them. And that's the reason why we are talking about the hybridity of intelligence and the role of the artificial intelligence, intelligence and machine intelligence can help the humans to realize what is going on and to acquire much more information that is necessary to be done and to get the context, real context of information so that we need less human information that we need. Dr. Next slide, Gordon, please. Two minutes, please. Yes, thank you. So I would like to, to, to end with the conclusion. See, I would like to say that intelligence in the core of, uh, of any effective and useful counter hybrid threats activities. Intelligence needs to be permanently adaptable. And this is uh, as a process, as a document, as an organization, and that's the role of those of intelligence studies. Reaching information superiority is important thing because controlling and managing information content, information channels and time management, just like in any NFL games, those who are watching NFL games knows that the time management is very crucial, needs to be done. Next slide, please. Searching for unknown unknowns in intelligence, fighting against hybrid threats is not useful. We need to share it, uh, to, to share it from the, and to change it from 2D to 3D models, because if we are searching for the unknown unknowns, we cannot raise the proper research questions. If we cannot raise the questions, we cannot get the proper answers. If we don't, cannot get proper answers, then we are disinformed. Next slide, please. Next, please. Just next, please. And the worst case is scenario that we think that we know, and there is a matter of fact, we don't know, and we are not aware of the fact that we know it. And that's the situation when we are brought in a situation that we make mistakes, we make different and wrongly decisions based on the non-knowledge. And that's something that we have to take in the future because more as we analyze it, present conflicts and wars, they are going to be in hybrid by, by methods, hybrid by activities, mm -hmm. and we need to do it mm -hmm. everything in order to be ready mm -hmm. to, to, to tackle those mm -hmm. uh, challenges in future. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. And I would like to thank you once more to the Doha Institute and Dr. Omar and his team to, to invite me here, to help me here, to allow me here to share some of my thoughts about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gordon. I just want to announce that the next presentation will be in Arabic, so if you need the headphone, I'll give you some time to bring the headphone. The four, uh, fourth uh, speaker is Dr. Ghazi Asaf. Dr. Ghazi Asaf is Associate Professor of Defense Economics and Assistance, Assistant Dean for Scientific Research Affairs at Joan Benjassim Academy for Defense Studies uh, in Qatar. He received his PhD in economics from uh, Swansea University, UK. He was Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Jordan and a directing staff member at the Royal Jordanian National Defense College. His teaching and research interests focus on macroeconomics applied Econometrics and economics of defense. He also has been involved uh, with the UNDP, with ESQA, EU, and the Economic Research Forum. Domestically, he has been involved in the Social Economic Council, National Center for Human Resources Development, and the Queen Rania Foundation. His interest focuses on applied economics relating especially to macroeconomics, economic development, international remittances, and financial and labor economics. His articles have appeared in Applied Economics Quarterly, International Journal of of social economics and Jordan Journal of Economics Sciences. Dr. Ghazi, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, uh, uh, dear Ayad. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, good morning to you all. I would like to express my deepest gratitude on this beautiful, happy day. Uh, uh, for being here among uh, our dear colleagues at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies at the Doha Institute. I would like to thank my colleagues for this kind invitation and this excellent organization, particularly Dr. Omar. We always heard about this center. Now we are witnessing the excellent organization, and it is a great pleasure to partake in these workshops and seminars that form an added value uh, when it comes to the knowledge, uh, even the title in, uh, of this, uh, uh, this uh, seminar uh, focuses on the state of the field, and this is very important. I will be speaking in Arabic, although the slides uh, are in English. And this is actually the first thing that I am going to tackle, the weakness or the absence of sources in Arabic, particularly when it comes to new topics. First and foremost, I would like to tell you that I feel that I specialize in economics, but also I have some knowledge in the security studies and uh, the political field, but I know that uh, the expertise in the room actually is way more than uh, the expertise I have based on my practical expertise and experience in developing some models, I try to add something to intelligence studies, this merging between economics, security sciences, and the topics relating to economic intelligence. Here, uh, uh, I will try to uh, respect the dedicated time or allocated time. I will be talking about the concept of economic intelligence, the origin of the economic intelligence, and then I will be talking about the importance of economic intelligence and how they serve the military intelligence and the exchange uh, between these two fields. And then I will try to add something to this field by talking about the early warning systems in order to project uh, economic crises and financial crises and uh, advanced uh, countries and states started using these uh, uh, systems in econometrics uh, in order to give warning or signals to decision makers in economics, particularly when it comes to uh, currency and uh, financial issues. And also, uh, we will I will be concluding uh, by highlighting a number of uh, topics uh, that need uh, further research. And I am in the right place because uh, at the Doha Institute, there are programs focusing on intelligence studies. And this is why we can uh, benefit from shedding the light on the research uh, of the students uh, in the future. And I will be uh, telling you about some references. So in the field of economic intelligence, if we can call it so, the general rule is the fact that the complex uh, uh, problems or complicated problems mean that the sciences are intertwined. So there's security, complexity, uh, and uh, reasons were economics. So this is why we had different fields uh, uh, overlapping and the basis was security studies. And this field benefited from the tools, methods, and techniques in economics. And this is why we have a multidisciplinary field called economic intelligence, or EI. It is about security studies, particularly relying on military intelligence, and economics, statistics, and uh, this is what leads us to economic intelligence. And uh, this highlights the big problem. Do we want uh, economic experts to serve this purpose, or we want military experts in order for them to serve the economic purpose? And this is the major debate that we have. 
And the concept of economic intelligence, uh, so uh, economic intelligence refers to the process of collecting and analyzing. It's not only about collecting. This is why we need people who specialize in analyzing the information, processing the information about economic and business activities in order to make informed decisions. Uh, at a level of the states, we will see the different uh, levels, or at the level of the institution sectors, and even individuals. A number of uh, concepts uh, in the field of economic intelligence focus on the uh, choices when it comes to investing uh, money at an individual level. And also, the term economic intelligence can also refer to economic crimes, and particularly when we talk about uh, money laundering or fraud, for instance, or uh, terrorism financing. So all these uh, things actually are served by the field of economic intelligence. This concept, this concept uh, very simply started with the end of the Second World War. Uh, Britain and the Soviet Union were introducing a number of uh, concepts, uh, economic concepts, as part of intelligence services. And then the United States of America followed in 1949. The U.S. formed uh, uh, research centers collecting information and data about the economies of the world in order to study the patterns of the economies for intelligence purposes. In 1951, the task of uh, studying the economic circumstances of states moved to the uh, uh, Central Intelligence Agency of the United States. So the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States uh, since then is uh, concerned with uh, analyzing the announced and unannounced economic indicators in order to determine the patterns and the trends of economies to be studied. and. Uh, the third of the efforts of U.S. intelligence back then and until now was focused on economic concepts and serving the national security of the United States based on the economic concept. After the 70s, with the developments and with the uh, oil uh, prices increasing, and the shift in the structures of economies, particularly in the Arab world and the countries that started relying on petrol income, the intervention of the CIA actually uh, became bigger in economic affairs. There are organizations, economic organizations internationally started appearing, and then the economic topics started surfacing. Uh, for instance, studying the capacity of the Russian economy to be resilient, the ruble, the Russian ruble, and the uh, reserves and central banks of countries that the United States uh, needs uh, to study when it comes to their economic circumstances. And this also extends to studying the macroeconomic policy uh, that was and still is applied in China, and also the economic sanctions that uh, were uh, uh, very efficient weapons uh, weapon uh, against countries in the region, relying particularly on economic information. Many times when we talk about the different levels and the importance of economic intelligence. Many people think that intelligence is about the macro. However, the economic intelligence, it also serves uh, governments by uh, highlighting the threats, the economic threats against national security because economy is part of the national security and affects it. And also, uh, partly, this uh, tackles companies, private companies, and individuals. We are not going to focus on these two because now we are talking, uh, or here we are talking about business intelligence. And this is something uh, different, a different topic. And uh, this needs some uh, micro uh, studies. In order for us not to be lengthy, let us talk about the economic intelligence and the military intelligence in terms of their relation. 
in one sentence we can say that uh, the two are related in that they both involve gathering and analyzing information for strategic purposes. So the economic intelligence serves the military intelligence uh, many times and vice versa. But uh, in several uh, examples, we have an independent objective. For instance, for the military intelligence, the objective or the target can be military. So information is gathered for solely for military uh, purposes, uh, not economic. And there were several examples about that. In economic intelligence, sometimes, particularly if uh, there are some sanctions looming, uh, economic sanctions looming, or, for instance, uh, waging a, an economic war against another country between uh, the U.S. and China, for instance, uh, which is still ongoing. And also the latest uh, case, uh, the balloon that was shot down. I was actually looking into indicators. Uh, are we talking about economic purposes or military purposes? The information uh, still uh, not that clear, but some uh, aspects could be economic as well. So the uh, intertwined relation means that military intelligence could provide information allowing the state to use intelligence uh, very efficiently if the information is clear and accurate when it comes to the economic intelligence structure if i am to summarize it so uh, we can talk about the governmental intelligence uh, so uh, the government related intelligence at the macro level here we can talk about two things we have the uh, economic intelligence, what uh, we are talking about today, and the economic espionage. The economic espionage actually needs uh, techniques, skills, and advanced, more advanced techniques. And uh, this is an ongoing process between the United States and China. For instance, China is uh, the number one country in the world when it comes to economic espionage. When it comes to non-government or non-governmental intelligence, this is different. So we have industrial espionage and competitive intelligence, and this focuses on the private sector. The types of data in economic intelligence, we have the open, announced, public information, 70% of the information in central bank reports or international organizations and institutions, or the reports published in academic publications. There's an analysis about a certain economy, and it's very easily accessible. The problem or the difficulty and the challenging part is in the 30% share that is remaining. In this 30%, we have unannounced uh, information that is not public, and we can deduce it from the patterns and the behavior of any of our competitor, for instance, a state that aims at targeting our industry, or what we're seeing in the high-tech uh, uh, battle between the uh, superpowers. So, 20% of that can be uh, uh, received by studying the behavior and the pattern. But the problem remains with the 10%. The 10% are very uh, difficult to access uh, and analyze by uh, studying models and patterns. This is why they need an advanced level, which is economic espionage. These are the levels of economic intelligence that are studied uh, in this field. Uh, and uh, the last three levels are important, the strategic level and also the financial level, the early warning system that we talked about, and the national economic intelligence, the macro that serves the national security interests. The most uh, well-known countries uh, uh, in this field uh, uh, successfully uh, uh, executing it uh, uh, or efficiently, the United States uh, through the uh, agencies, uh, in intelligence agencies, they have actually economic units, France and China. And as we have said, China is uh, famous for 
economic espionage with advanced capabilities to get the 10 percent information that we need through espionage. These are a number of countries. I will now move uh, to the early warning systems, the EWS. Uh, so this is a purely economic uh, topic. What is the uh, objective? So we're talking about EWS models uh, to project or predict a financial crisis. It is a system that relies on studying and analyzing a wide range of indicators throughout years and decades, maybe quarterly, maybe daily, maybe yearly data, and then by using statistical techniques and measurement techniques that could give us signals. And these signals facilitate the projection of a certain financial crisis or threat or uh, depreciation of a currency or the collapse of a certain uh, financial system by reading these indicators. And these indicators were efficient in many countries and provided a lot of information to intelligence agencies, particularly in the United States of America and the developed countries, indicators about a potential crisis in the first quarter of year so and so. This was uh, using the uh, EWS. And this actually or partly relies on published data about the performance of financial markets, the prices of stocks, uh, the uh, prices of assets, the economic performance, the financial performance of institutions, and we delve in the details, the uh, profits, the fluctuation in economic growth, etc. Two minutes, please. I'm almost done. Uh, actually, I have two papers uh, published uh, regarding the uh, early warning system. This actually is part of one of the papers. Uh, the example was Jordan and Egypt. This is not uh, an earthquake here. So here you can see when we have a vertical line above the red horizontal line, this means that during this quarter, this day, this month, uh, there were indicators that a financial crisis would be prominent. It might happen, it might not happen. There is a margin of error, but there are indicators that give the decision maker indications that, uh, for instance, the depreciation of the currency is going to happen. So uh, on the top, we have the Jordanian example below the Egyptian example since 1980 to 2011. So from 1980 to 2015, and we hope to have them updated as well. The upper panel here gives you a specific month where there were problematic issues that could lead to a problem at the level of the currency or the financial market. Uh, for instance, um, uh, September, November 18, uh, 1988, etc. These are some avenues for future research in the field of economic intelligence. And we encourage our students to uh, research, uh, talking about the relationship uh, between uh, intelligence and the different dimensions of uh, national security and also the uh, uh, putting together of uh, economic policies and the use of technology and the development of technology at the service of economic intelligence and also the relation between intelligence uh, and uh, uh, trade pattern between uh, the different countries. And this is why the decision makers, for instance, would sign a free uh, trade uh, agreement uh, with a number of countries uh, based on the information. As uh, for the sources or the references, uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, uh, is uh, the research and analysis uh, unit uh, for the Economist. The Oxford Economics as well have a number of uh, reports. The Naval Postgraduate uh, School in the United States, uh, they have a center and some reports that are not published uh, on the website, but uh, they focus also on uh, intelligence. Uh, and the Joanne Ben Jassim Academy, we have a master's degree in economic uh, uh, or in uh, intelligence studies, actually. And this is the uh, uh, these are the courses. And 
for the second consecutive year, I'm teaching economic intelligence, and one of our students wrote in the previous program. She is here with us. Uh, she is welcome. And uh, she wrote one of the first thesis, uh, master's thesis, about the uh, economies in the Arab world. Of course, uh, this is a military institution, and there is a confiden confidentiality uh, uh, issue or concern relating to this. Hello, doctor. I'm done. This is the first. This is my first paper regarding early warning system. This is a, the second paper in the same field, and these are the most important uh, sources or references that could serve this field. Even Potter's book, The Economic Intelligence and National Security. Qu very quickly, this photo shows the importance of an early warning system uh, in the absence of EWS. You need all this money to buy just one kilogram of tomato. Thank you so much. So the floor is open for questions. شكرا جزيلا لكل المتحدثين لدي سؤالين بروفيسور سيرز اند ذا اذر تو بيتر سو ذا فيرست وان اي واز وندر اف يو كود تيل اس مور اباوت يور ورك اون ايجيبت يو اتس فيري فاسينيتين اند اي هاف ريد يور بوك از ويل اند ام شور ذات يو هاف ان ابديتد فيرجن سو اف يو كود تيل اس مور اباوت يور ورك فايندينجز اون ايجيبت and uh, the second question is to Peter. Um, you mentioned that you, you take issues with having practitioners working or shaping up the field. If you could elaborate more on that, and equally if you could tell us more, because you didn't have the time to tell us more about critical security studies and your take on that. Thank you. A secure, critical intelligence studies. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask a, what may seem a peculiar question for a panel on, on what academic research can tell us about the world of intelligence. I want to ask what the world of intelligence can tell us about doing academic research better. And the reason I ask this is, as Peter went through the literature on intelligence, there's, of course, a literature on the cognitive psychology of intelligence, you know, uh, Richard Hewer all the way up to Phil Tetlock and the Good Judgment Project today. And that has found that political experts are terrible at predicting political outcomes, that political scientists are, in fact, no better than dart-throwing monkeys in Phil Tetlock's famous formation, and that having a PhD has no statistical impact on your ability to correctly anticipate political outcomes. And much of the work in cognitive psychology in the intelligence community has been around cognitive bias and confirmation bias and so forth, and the danger of paradigms, the danger of over-attachment to paradigms. Graduate education in international relations is all about emphasizing the centrality of paradigms. So it's always struck me that what the intelligence community has understood about good analysis is the antithesis of the way we train graduate students. We, we train graduate students in a way that is most likely to make them wrong about the way the world is. So I'd like you to ask, I'd like you to reflect on what the, and we also know from the work of David Mandel and, and Alan Barnes in Canada that intelligence, and I was the coder for that project, that intelligence analysts do a lot better than political experts in general anticipating outcomes and not because of access necessarily to classified information. So the question is what do we know about how the intelligence community operates that for programs such as the program in Doha would allow us to better train graduate students to better understand the world of security and better anticipate emergent security threats and response. Thank you. 
So, uh, thank you very much for this uh, extremely interesting panel. It's always good to, to get some insight into this secret stuff like intelligence. Uh, the, my question is mostly to, to Professor Jackson. Uh, the, I saw on your presentation, uh, you know, among the, uh, the goals of intelligence, I think it's, it's justified to add also like explanation of your own policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis some issues. You mentioned the case of Iraqi war, but it of course, uh, you know, like work both ways. Uh, we know from, from uh, Wall Street Journal report that, that uh, when uh, US informed the allies about Russian imminent invasion uh, uh, of Ukraine, you know, guys from Europe say, you know, we, we, we had this uh, during the Iraq war, we don't believe you any anymore. So uh, uh, to what extent uh, we can uh, consider Consider, you know, the, the intelligence information as uh, a tool, you know, to mobilize uh, domestic, uh, you know, opinions because it's very difficult to challenge, you know, the, the, that, that some of the decisions based on the intelligence secret information. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, should we try it as, as, as credible source of information? And the second question is a more practical one. It's about imminent. Uh, so, uh, you know, after uh, the, the, the and uh, when it comes to the Ukrainian war again, so we know that after the, the, the Russians shoot like 2,000 missiles against against Ukraine, both uh, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. According to DOD, you know, Ukrainians still have like majority of, of their capabilities when it comes to uh, aviation, both fixed wing and rotary uh, capabilities. So, you know, how it's possible in this, this world that we know almost everything, you know, based on, on, on intelligence, on, on imminent, on the satellites, that, that Ukrainians were, were able to, to hide, you know, like majority of their aviation, uh, you know, uh, from, from, from Russian satellites. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Jeroen, Jeroen Gunning from uh, King's College London. Um, I, I want to pick up on various speakers said, um, that emphasized the importance of, of uh, having more uh, Arab scholars, Arab voices, uh, etc. Um, but I wanted to sort of pick up a, a theme from the critical literature, which is uh, to what extent, uh, um, I mean, how much kind of theorizing has there been from sort of the, the Arab world, from the Arab experiences? Um, what does it mean, for example, for concepts like intelligence or, or the state? Uh, do they need to be uh, uh, rethought or uh, in, in, in the context of, of particular kind of Arab states? Uh, what's the colonial legacy, for example, um, of, of the various intelligence, the, kind of the, the colonial intelligence agencies? How did that impact on, on post-colonial intelligence? The Cold War, sort of the, I mean, think about the, 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 the coup against Mossadegh. Uh, what role did that play in, in creating sort of an, an, an intelligence state apparatus because of the the kind of the the, the, the meddling of, of, of different sort of superpowers in the region because of its its uh, strategic importance. So kind of more, more kind of reflections maybe from the Arab world on thinking about intelligence, uh, uh, the history of, of state building, uh, sort of uh, global power relations, which I think would would strengthen the field and 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 add a depth that you might not get from intelligence studies within, for example, Europe or, or, or North America. Um, so any thoughts on that? Okay, thank you. This is the first round, so we'll take another round. I'll start on the same order, so Professor... Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for all the questions. Some very challenging ones, but all very fair. Uh, the first on practitioners. I mean, practitioners are invaluable as sources for, in some ways, everyday practices within intelligence communities. And they can fill in gaps at times. Uh, they can also pr put you in touch with people, uh, former practitioners inside for, for interviews. But I think it's important not to be naive that they are also, I think, interested in shaping lines of inquiry and shaping the parameters of the discipline. The fact that the ultra secret was kept secret for so long because of a, a a specific and particular uh, British government and American government policy to keep it secret suggests that the state has a real a capability and capacity to shape kind of the, the conceptual horizons of academic research. And so it's really important to be wary of that. Uh, for example, 
you know, Chris Andrew, who was one of my supervisors as for my PhD, is well known for arguing that intelligence plays a fundamentally different role in authoritarian societies than it does in uh, liberal democratic societies. But I live in the UK, and the UK is a surveillance state, effectively. And a lot of the surveillance that's being done is by kind of hybrid tools that are also intelligence assets. You know, the, 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 the British state, and most states, has uh, uh, amazing reach into the private lives of its citizens of a kind that would, I mean, when I started my, my career, uh, it was Susan Strange and their treat of the state. And the state is more intrusive now than at any point in history. And it's only moving, I think, in one direction. And we don't talk about this as intelligent scholars. And I think this is interesting, and it may be part of the same dynamic. Critical intelligence studies, I mean, I don't want to be a, a, an old curmudgeon and say, no, no, we don't need any critical intelligence studies. Not at all. My problem is, I think, a couple, so, twofold. The first is, and it's not all critical intelligence studies, but there was an, an, an issue of intelligence and national security published in 2021 on critical intelligence studies. And one of the chief targets was the positivist foundations of the academic literature on intelligence. And the fact that most academic, most of this literature had argued that the, you know, that the, the right purpose of intelligence analysis is the pursuit of objective truth. When, if you go back to Bob Jervis, I mean, he, there's real skepticism there that objective truth is possible at all. And then in 2004, and then afterwards, I was writing that, you know, intelligence is a social and political process. It's fundamentally ideological, and the choices of analysts as well as uh, collectors of information are shaped by ideological cultural backgrounds that are impossible to kind of step outside of. And so the idea that analysts produce objective truth is very naive. And I was teaching this to people at GCHQ in Norway, in France, you know, way back in the mid 2000s. But in 2021, there's a, a move to kind of to argue that, and so probably this is partly me just being an old guy arguing, you know, I was doing this long before you, Sonny, which is boring and probably retrograde. But I'm very, very enthusiastic about uh, the Paris School and its argument that, in fact, intelligence is fundamental to bureaucratic machinery that produces insecurity. And this concept of, uh, you know, the society determining the security that, that, that uh, the security machinery that that uh, it, it, it has, and then that security machinery in a way determining the kind of security society has and producing insecurity. I, mean, I think that's very, it's a fascinating concept and I'm really intrigued by it and not least because uh, Didier Bigot is a good friend and we both are interested in Pierre Bourdieu. So, uh, and in, in training, I think probably more historians should be, I think historians are better, historians don't use the inductive method in the same way. We do use it because it's impossible not to use it, but we aren't taught to think in per paradigms in the same way as social scientists, and that might may be part of the problem. But I would defer, I think, to Owen on 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 this. Uh, but predicting the future is a very tricky business. It's impossible. I mean, if, complexity theory is probably the best the best kind of key because. Uh, any action can produce myriad reactions, which in turn produce myriad reactions. And the idea to, you know, this is why intentions are so hard to, 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 to understand. Although interestingly, uh, you could argue, and I don't know, I think we know a lot less than many people think about assessments of, of the kind of balance between Ukraine and Russia. But it seems that anyway, that Western agencies seem to get Russian intentions right but miss the, the kind of capability kind of uh, balance between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I think probably I'll stop there because I want to give somebody else a chance to speak, but I have lots more to say. Thank you. Uh, um, so talking about Egypt, I would love to uh, get back into uh, 
researching uh, Egyptian intelligence. It's just I've been diverted in different directions since I, I wrote that book, uh, not the least of which was Iran. Uh, that was what I did at, at DIA. Uh, was, I was an Iran analyst. Um, as far as developments in Egypt, the thing that strikes me the most is how little, okay? And I'm, I'm the person who wrote a book in 2010 that said, uh, you know, whatever, the 30-year mark, Hosni Mubarak's government looks more stable than ever. <laughs> so how little we actually knew about the so-called deep state in Egypt. Um, you know, uh, one thing that was sort of almost by rote in the intelligence community, the U.S. one anyway, uh, was that uh, general intelligence was the most powerful agency and the other two, uh, military intelligence and what used to be called the, the Mabach of the state security, uh, were not as significant. But of course, now we know, thanks to General al-Sisi, uh, that in fact, military intelligence was more important than we realized, right? And maybe it's because at the embassy level in Cairo, it was the CIA that dealt with general intelligence, and it was the DIA knuckle-draggers who dealt with military intelligence, right? I'm, taking a bit of a slam on my, my old practice. Um, but, but I think, again, what did we miss in Egypt, not only in 2011, but the importance of the agencies? Uh, of course, the other notable event in Egypt, it was a few years ago, were the release of taped conversations, uh, which was almost unprecedented, right? It was uh, General al-Sisi and his aides joking, joking about how much aid they were getting from the Emirates, uh, and how much more was coming. Uh, the next question about you know, what Intel can do for academic research. You know, I, I'm never going to say that Intel has been very successful at predicting the future. Um, there are all kinds of examples of where it wasn't. Um, but I would say that there's something to be said for rigorous methodology. Right? Not just winging it, but I mean an actual rigorous methodology in the use of your sources, and then balanced assessment. Um, it used to drive Pentagon policymakers crazy when we would write something with a lot of probabilities and likelies and possibilities in it, but you cannot make a definitive statement. And of course, Donald Rumsfeld uh, was one of the more notorious for saying, it doesn't tell me anything. Um, that being said, I would say that the best agency in the, in the U.S. intelligence community at analysis is probably the least known. It's uh, in the Department of State. It's the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. What makes them good? Um, not size. They're, they're small, right, which has its benefits. And their analysts have been there a long time. So there's grooming. Uh, and there, there's a steady development of their capability, which you don't find at CIA, and you certainly don't find in the military side. Um, the third question, which was, uh, you know, colonial agencies in the post-colonial state. I mean, this is the topic for people to write about here, right? Um, because there is a lot of information. I know this because I'm researching Saudi Arabia right now. Um, just don't tell them that. Um, you know, for example, you know, the handover of power, right, uh, that of course happened uh, in this part of the world from Great Britain to, to Qatar to, to the United Arab Emirates to Bahrain at the same time. There's a great article that's out there uh, that was written a number of years ago about Arabization of Omani intelligence. Look it up. Uh, because it's written from a Western perspective, so that's a limitation. But it talks about the handover. And in Oman, it was a very, very gradual process for a number of reasons. Um, the last point that I want to make in response to the question is, I think there was, and I've been looking for this information, in the 1950s, a decision made probably in coordination with the British in the United States that we, the US, needed to create intelligence agencies in the Arab world, right? Um, Egypt, you know, 1954, EGIS was created. No coincidence that Savak in Iran created around the same time. Go to Jordan, and, and we know that's probably the best example because of people who talk too much. 
that the king of Jordan, King Hussein, was taking money from the CIA, right? Um, and that the CIA engineered the creation of the Jordanian General Intelligence Service. So um, there's a lot of information out there. Uh, it's just it needs someone to synthesize and analyze it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gordon, do you want to reflect on any of the questions? Yes, thank you. I would like, just like to, to give a few comments on the evolving intelligence that we have an example to be here, here and ready in the, before the Russian aggression in Ukraine. The, at first, it was the first time that the intelligence agencies published these kind of reports with a huge amount of the intelligence data and, it, and the intelligence analysis. Uh, it caused uh, several positive effects. First, it was it was possible to see the, the, to the Russians, for example, that the United States and the other intelligence community agencies from the international organizations knows that the Russians are going to really would like to invent that are preparing to, to invade, to, uh, to organize aggression against the Ukraine. And it caused probably a, little, a lot of challenges for the Russian intelligence community to check and to see why the Americans and the Brits and Canadians and the others knows what uh, uh, about their intentions and uh, what they, they are looking for. And probably it brings them in the worst case scenario for the, any intelligence agency, an intelligence community, to take deal about yourself, to try to find the leaks and most. Second thing, when it was proved that those uh, warning intelligence were, were correct, it increased the, by my opinion, increased the the, the trustworthiness of the populations to the intelligence agency said, well, we have a reason why we are paying them. We have a reason to trust them because they prove to be correct. Third thing is that these warning intelligence proved to uh, uh, help to the West community to reach the national cohesion of their populations to support the political decisions that the EU member states and NATO ally countries has to support the Ukrainian people to fight with themselves, be it against the Russian aggression. And because, you know, in the West, the perception of the population about the political decisions or the decisions of the politicians is very important due to the fact that every four years are the elections and they are preparing for them. And the, the last positive sign is that Ukraine had enough time to prepare themselves to do whatever was it was necessary to be done in order to tackle the Russians' aggression on a strategic level. Because I would just like to comment something. Uh, Ukrainians in 2022 were not the Ukraine in 2014. Ukrainians had a much more than five brigades. Uh, Ukrainians have a very skillful and very powerful and with a huge number of the members of, the, for example, Special Operations Forces. They have a huge quantity of the Territorial Guard, so they they were not just the only five brigades. It was a development process that was running for uh, several years and it proved to be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Razi. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to just ask in English, uh, answer the, the question in English. Uh, just, I want just to relate the question about the Arab intelligence systems and to relate this to the economic intelligence. Uh, this is from my point of view. Economic intelligence, in Arab word, uh, my country, we cannot actually make a, a general or a generalized inference about uh, economic intelligence of, and its effectiveness uh, for the, whole, the Arab world as a whole. This should be clear because Although some of Arab uh, countries has established uh, a unit for intelligence now, but still at the very early stages. But what we found actually from uh, uh, meeting students actually from intelligence units here, and in Arab words, from my experience, there is a huge gap between the intelligence in economics, especially economic intelligence, and what they are doing in military. They are always uh, coming from a military uh, 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 point of view. They cannot apply what they have, skills from a military and political views to the economic intelligence. Uh, in Arab words, we still need a lot of actually resources, development, investment, training to be like in a parallel with the very successful intelligence, uh, uh, economic intelligence unit. So we still have a gap actually between uh, the, the real life and uh, what we have uh, on, uh, on, on practice. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take uh, 
second round. If there is any question, no? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we want to thank the speakers as well. Thank so you. we'll have the lunch break now. Thank, thank you. you very much.